My name is Kayla. I am a anti-racist facilitator and a creative producer. I'm from New Jersey. I also work in New York City. I've done a lot of uh, theater producing. Um, I work for the Broadway League, the American Theater Wing. I've worked for Crossroads Theater Company, which is an African-American theater company that won the Tony Award, which is so exciting. And I also work for Rutgers University. I was born in Daejeon, uh, South Korea, and I'm a Korean-American adoptee. So growing up, uh, I actually, um, my family did a lot. It was really raised more Italian. So we did a lot of things like together. We had all lot of big birthday parties. It was a lot of gathering, a lot of just being around, uh, doing a lot of things. When I grew up, my house was over like this one area. My dad worked at um, right next door. So they owned this apartment house. So my aunt lived over there and then my grandmother lived behind. So it was a constant family, constant parties, constantly going from one to the next, constantly doing arts and crafts. My aunt are going down to visit my grandmother and having like big like dinners and just Italian spaghetti and just a lot of fun things. So like for me, growing up was all about family. Growing up, I've always been interested in the arts. So like I remember from a young age, my Aunt Mary Lou, which is my dad's sister, would go next to, would go from our house next door where he they worked. And she would always have arts and crafts. It would be either coloring books, it'd be making windowed uh, designs, it would be um, having popsicle sticks and everything that you can think of or science experiments that is artistic or colorful we had to do. So my whole life was wrapped around creating. I feel like I felt the most comfortable uh, in the art community. Because at the time, uh, growing up, I have uh, was very active in different things. I did softball, I did acting, dancing, like a lot of different things. And I felt the most free to express myself when I was in the arts. High school got a little bit more difficult for me because it was very clear um, that I am Asian in a fully white upper middle class town. So I had a lot of racism that was happening and I had to hide a lot of my identity where I would introduce myself and be like, I'm Kayla, but I'm not really Asian. So for me, going to the arts and being able to, um, I love music, I love dancing, I love singing, I love just being a part of any type of art, even like visual arts. So that allowed me to express myself in different ways and feel free. So I'm an anti-racist facilitator, so that means that I'm more of a consultant. So I will come in and work with um, individuals who could be on a, like a whole, um, people sign up to do the work and, and their own personal journey, or with organizations. I particularly focus more on the arts, um, particularly because I believe that the ideology of um, racism, because there's different levels, you have like the institution, you have the levels of like lawmaking, you have uh, government where people make, uh, they make laws and you have people who have to enforce the laws. So you have the judge and court and you have the arts, which I think is, can uphold a lot of stereotypes or can break down stereotypes. So for me, I think arts are really important because people can change their points of view or you come in contact with one show and that one show can make a difference to make you think something different or plant a little seed to make you think differently. So for me, having the arts be more um, anti-racist is a really great way to make a different impact on a lot of other people. So that's kind of why I focus more on the arts organizations. And what I do with them is a lot of looking at harm, how harms happened, how to repair the harm, how to reduce the harm and repair relationships. So when it comes to anti-racism work that I focus on, yes, part of it is education, but I focus more on action steps and, and acknowledging like part of this is acknowledging feelings and emotions. There's times where we have to learn and grow from each other. And a lot of it's sharing different experiences, sharing things that um, hurt us, share things that are bring us joy, laughter and all this. So we get to understand like each other in that way. So a lot of it is talking communication. How do we um, just be with one another and share stories and listen? How do we work on this exercise or build this muscle of not being afraid of conflict? If conflict happens, how can we have a true apology? How do we acknowledge the harm? How can we learn from it and grow from it? From the people that I've met, no one has actually been like, ha, I want to be an anti-racist facilitator. We all kind of fell into it because there's no actual way. Because I have people ask me like, how do you do this? I want to do this. And I'm like, I can't tell you <laughs> exactly how I did it. I can just tell you from my life experience of constantly wanting to know more about people because I've always been unheard or un like not really seen for who I am. I always felt like, code switching, like, and not in a way that is like, oh, this is part of me because of white supremacy, I have to switch, but because I wasn't fully able to show up as my full self because I didn't know what that meant. So there's times where I'd be with white friends and be like, okay, I'm going to change me more American. Or when with a lot of friends of color, at the time growing up with more black students or Latinx, where I had to be like, okay, I can feel a little more free or I can talk about culture a little bit. I can ask questions, questions I'm not able to ask around my white friends. Constantly doing this switch for me and my life experience of dealing with racism led to wanting to do more theater work 
of that. After I graduated Rutgers, I wanted to do more um, work with Broadway because I thought, oh, that's a goal. Everyone wants to go Broadway. And when I was there, I dealt with a lot of racism in different mounds where being a female who's young, who wants to be a producer and also a person of color, I had a fight. So there's other people who are around me who are also producers and they'd be like, okay, we have to fight each other for this one role. And I was like, why do we have to fight? Why, where's, why is this one role? Why can't we have more opportunities that we take down the table and allow all of us to be producers? What, it, what would that look like? And being like, well, that doesn't exist. Or you have to do something in order to get this that is not even a part of the job description. And I never wanted to do that. I'm not the type of person to want to tear someone else down. I feel like we can all build each other. So I was like, this is not for me. So then I started exploring what theater was in different capacities. And because Marshall, who's my theater mentor that I had at Rutgers, and also like I consider the closest person like as a dad right now, he guided me in very different ways and introduced me to the nonprofit world of theater, where I worked at Crossroads Theater Company. And Crossroads was the first company that allowed me to be me and explore and change my identity. So while I was there, I was working with so many different beautiful individuals who were multifaceted and multi-layered, uh, different backgrounds, and seeing them come together and saying, this is a space that they can just be. Where I've had artists, they were telling me like, oh, when I work for this theater company, I just put headphones in, I just because li I, I cannot listen to people, what they're speaking, because what they say is usually harmful to me. But I need the paycheck. I need this on my resume. This is a great theater. I need this. So I have to do whatever I can to protect myself. But when they come to Crossroads, they don't do that. It's like a family. You huddle, you show up, and you share. And because of that, I maybe want to do more art that is meaningful, more art that's making a difference as underrepresented um, communities, um, to have them be seen. So when I had the opportunity to go to London for my master's, um, that's what I was looking at. I was at one student in the class who was like, I want to do a, a festival about disabilities and having access. What does that mean? Or doing a festival about um, for people of color, having their voices be heard or exploring mental health. So I was so interested in all these topics, mostly because of my life story of what I've also dealt with growing up and people I've met influenced my interest of how to make people who aren't often seen or heard and giving them a platform to do that. And while I was there, the president of the school basically said racist remarks. He said people of color aren't smart enough, talented enough, and can't afford to go to an art school. And that were only quotas. And in London, a lot of individuals were like, I don't know what to do. Let's go on Twitter. Let's like attack him. Being an American, being a person who constantly knows about protesting and walkouts, I was like, let's create a walkout. And also because I'm a producer, it was like, let's gather people. But before we do this, let's talk. So I talked to students of different backgrounds, not just students who identify as uh, people of color, but I also talked to students who were trans, who had gender issues, sexual orientation, um, disabilities, and talked about what is this goal not providing for them? How are they feeling? And it was very clear that everyone didn't feel safe. So because of all this, I gathered it, talked to deans, talked to staff. Staff felt the same way, that it was more of the leadership as well as the board. And the only thing that was needed is having students and faculty come together to have a voice. So that's where we pushed forward with the walkout. And we made it so everyone was able to have a platform to speak about their truth. We got other organizations to support us that eventually the a principal ended up getting fired. So she left two years later. And it started this journey for them to be more anti-racist. And that started a whole other aspect and opened a lot of other doors for me of having these conversations. So a lot of the way to get to anti-racism work has been because of my values, because my story, who I met, and my passion for just wanting to share and have people being seen and heard. So things I've learned and discovered and accepted about myself in Korea have been being able to be okay with being two spaces. I acknowledge like home for me is people and having to acknowledge like I have a home in London, I have a home in Korea now, I have a home in New York, I have home in like California, all these different locations because of people. So a lot of what I'm learning about identities is so fluid and changes. So like currently being okay with not fully being comfortable with what it means to be Korean, being okay and having a support group of people who accept me for who I am and how important that is. So learning more about um, what I need to be okay with accepting with that, how to love myself, how to let others love me, and learning and growing together and knowing that um, we're humans. We're gonna change every day, every minute, every second. I'm where I'm at and that is okay. I have a lot to grow. I have a lot to heal. I have a lot to learn. Our identity does influence who we are and how we move through the world, but we're more than just that. My name is Kaylee Kim Vodapak, and this is my Korean American story. Mm -hmm.